Hello and welcome to the 42 Rugby Show. Well, Ireland made it three wins out of four in November with a 27-24 victory over the Wallabies in Dublin on Saturday. Joining us to discuss all the action is Eddie O'Sullivan, the former Ireland head coach. And in this episode, we're going to analyse some of the big plays that helped Ireland to a third Southern Hemisphere scalp. We'll talk about where they stand ahead of the 2017 Six Nations and we'll also look at some of the depth in Joe Schmidt's squad. Eddie, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, a pretty frenetic game on Saturday. Lost some big guys to injury in the first half and, and gave up a pretty big lead. What were the characteristics of, the, of that Irish victory? Um, I think a <clears throat> number of things we saw throughout the Autumn Series, their ability to dominate possession, which they've done consistently now against the All Blacks and Australia, which is hugely important in terms of keeping the ball and, and putting pressure on the opposition. Um, their ability to cope with players off the bench, out of position, and I think probably the biggest one is psychologically uh, having given up a lead like that with depleted forces, not just to close out the game, but to come back and take the lead and then close out the game. I thought it was an extraordinary achievement under the circumstances. And we had a similar parallel in Chicago when the All Blacks scored those three quick tries in the second half. Now we were in the lead there and Robbie Henshaw's try killed them off. This was even better. We lost the lead and Simon Zebo's score took the lead back and then we shut the game out. And I thought those things in particular in the general con context of the game were, were huge. Is there a bit more maturity? Like Rory Best, 100 cap, great great yeah. tribute to him and, and he deserved his amazing reception towards the end of the game. Is there a bit of maturity there developing in the Iron squad, do you think? Um, I suppose with every team is on a bit of a journey in terms of uh, developing their leadership group and their maturity as a group. And I think you're seeing this team now kind of developing in, along those lines because you don't win those big games, you don't close out those big games um, without having that sense of calm and composure under pressure and that takes good leadership on the field and uh, someone like Rory Best now, probably one of the most understated guys you'll ever meet, like a phenomenal rugby player, punching well above his weight even physically on the field, uh, but his leadership skills are on the team, very calm and composed. Uh, very highly respected guy, but then other guys probably cropping up, like I suppose Conor Murray I think has had a big role to play as a leader, uh, Devon Toner, um, you know the back row, Jamie he slips around the team a long time, um, and all those things go to glue the team together, and you only find out how good the glue is when the pressure comes on, like every system is great when there's no pressure, it's when the pressure comes on will the system hold, and the leadership system has held very well, it held in South Africa, it held in Chicago and it held last weekend. And again, I would even say the game we lost against New Zealand, we really ran them to the pin of their collar. They really had to go to town to win that game. So all those things bode very well in terms of the development of the team as an entity and the leadership within it. Michael Checker came in after, well, it was hardly a surprise, he came in after the game and, and he had a go at the referee while saying, I can't have a go at the referee. He was not very yeah, subtle. Yeah, so you do it. No, he, he said he couldn't go into, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, he said he couldn't go into specific issues. But what, 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 was your, what was your take on that? Was Jerome Garces in, in favour of Ireland? Or um, how that go? Well, I don't think he was. I, 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 there's, it's an, an extraordinary statistic. Uh, and statistics, you know, you know can, can be bent or twisted. Anyway, like, but one thing you can't change is over the three autumn games, against two against New Zealand and one against Australia, the penalty count has been extraordinary in Ireland's favour. Uh, two in New Zealand, 14 penalties. And again... Um, 13 on Saturday, like that's that's 41 penalties to the opposition and a grand total of 11. Now 11 is probably one game is not the penalties. So how's that happening? Well, our discipline has been holding really well. We're not getting involved in silly stuff, uh, which you know draws penalties and yellow cards. We're not crazy at the rock. We're knowing when to leave the ball, when to. And I suppose if you're looking for a guide to that, on the weekend uh, in Paris. I think New Zealand had 14 penalties again. Mm. So was the referee on New Zealand's back in Paris? Well, you know, it's happened to them three times now, so maybe they need to look at themselves a little bit on that. Australia, but any coach that comes out of a game like Cheka and sees a penalty count of 13 to 3 is going to strike a chord with them. But I do think Ireland are doing a lot of things right to get the referee on their side and to see things through, through their prism. Um, so that maybe you can see he's leaning our way in certain situations. But sometimes you have to go about winning a referee over. Like he, he believes you're on the right track. And, and I Rory think Best is doing a good job of that, isn't he? Absolutely. No, I, I, I will referee. say one thing. I thought in the second game against New Zealand, he did give the referee a hard time. He was in his ear a lot. And I was going, hold on a minute. You don't want to... I mean, you might have a case on sometimes, but you can really start to turn referee against you. And 
it's not that the referee in his head goes, right, I'm going to do this team in now. That doesn't happen. But the 50-50 calls, which could go either way, and you can't argue with them, suddenly fall the other way or fall your way. So Ireland have done a lot in terms of presenting that discipline uh, on the field um, in every aspect of their game, and it has served them very well. And I know you could say 14 to 4 in the All Blacks twice, 13 to 3 against Australia. I you mean, know, all three referees got it wrong. I don't know. I mean, like, the, 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 there is a strong case of saying Ireland are just a very, very smart, disciplined team who do not give anything away for nothing. Other teams are less careful, and maybe they could have made the case. You come to the Northern Hemisphere, it's a different style of rugby, and they haven't adapted. You know, and we go down there, we have to adapt. So it's a good discussion, but it's a statistic that should wonder how long more can exist for going into the Six Nations. How can we keep a penalty count to three or four in a Six Nations game? Which I think is a factor going forward in where we could be in relation to our discipline, because there are other parts of our defence that are not as functional as our discipline. We'll, we'll come back to that, but we just want to look at Ireland's tries against, against the Wallabies. Three nice tries. They did lose players to injury, but they got Simon Zebo off the bench and he had some, some big plays. How do you think Australia would have reviewed this first try, Zebo's Grubber, Earls getting onto the ball? How would they have looked at it? Well, they'd have looked at that as a bit of bad luck on their behalf. Like, there was a four on four, uh, everything was closed off. They had two sweepers in place. What could go wrong? Well, a rugby ball bounces in an erratic way and Zebo's Grubber was sublime. Earls reads the bounce, comes in takes it on the, on the fly and then steps under the cover and offloads. Henderson was probably the great line there. Henderson's line up field here, yeah. gets him right in the, in the, uh, in the, in the uh, slipstream of, of Errols and it's an offload and we like to run to the post. It was one of those tries that that's what, uh, that's what Zebo was trying to do. That's what Errols was trying to do. It was well constructed but Australia look at it and go, well, if we had this back again, we couldn't do that differently. We had everything in place. So it's one of those ones, you know. It just happens. The second one, was a little bit more complex and there's a couple of things we wanted to pick out. We'll, we'll come to Devon Toner's yeah. involvement. We have Ian Henderson highlighted yeah. with David Pocock about five metres in front yeah. of the rock yeah. there. Yeah. Ireland have probably been accused by other teams of doing this quite a lot, the clearing, of well, it, clearing deep. W what's involved? That's in one that? of those things that it, the touch just should have probably picked up on that. Like that's going beyond the rock and it's illegal and it's not supposed to happen and Henderson got away with it. Now Pocock didn't help himself by getting agitated and going back for seconds. Yeah. Had he not gone back for seconds he might have been on his feet to tackle Gary Ringrose and they might have scored but he went back for seconds and when he got up it was over. But I think they have a case there. I think Chaka was upset about that. That, that is under normal circumstances if the touch judge puts out that flag as he should have and the referee goes upstairs it's a penalty, and that's not a try. It's a penalty to Australia, and they cleared their lines. But it went unnoticed. But even after that, I was surprised there wasn't more of a do about... Uh, there was a, a, a sense of blocking for ring rust to get into that space. Yeah. J just before we move on to that, I just want to ask you a bit more about that, that clearing deep. Is that, a, is that an actual policy that teams have to... to get well, the old story is if you're going to take an out of the rock as a cleaner, you should take somebody else out with you and put them on the ground. It's not malicious in it. It's about numbers game. If Pocock is on his backside with you, he's out of the game which, as well as you are. So if you're cleaning out somebody, you'll make sure they don't get back into the game. Um, in a sense, taking him out is not malicious. It's like a tackle. Okay. He's, he's, now not, uh, he's not, now not part of the defence and you're not part of the attack. So it's, just a number, it's a numbers game. So generally speaking, yeah, if you go to a rock and you take somebody out, you make sure you get up first so he's not in the game before you. Yeah, like Ringrose did really well, obviously, to finish this exceptionally low to the ground. He yeah. carried really low all day. Well, it, this was hardly off the training field. It was uh, supposed to go to a pot, I think, and the ball went behind and it bobbled on the ground and Ringrose picked it off his bootlaces and took full advantage of us, you know, an opportunity that he couldn't have expected to present itself. But if you look at the picture here, Toner definitely Toner's here. blocks. And the two players inside are blocking, less obvious because they're standing there. But Toner does nudge the defender. And I think, again, I was surprised there wasn't a review of that as well, because the question is, would the Australian defender have made the tackle? Uh, well, we don't know. He should have got the opportunity. And if he missed the tackle, he missed it. But the fact you denied him the opportunity to make the tackle by nudging him is enough to review that. And it could have been called back. Now, again, Garces was happy, ran out and got warders. And I, but I'm surprised that I would have made more of that than the Pocock incident, to be honest with you, because... Yeah. Pocock probably did himself no favours by, as I said, going back for seconds. He was so irate about being cleaned out because he knew exactly what Henderson was doing. If he'd got up, he might have been there for, for Ringrose, but he kind of took himself out of the game, you know. But that, to me, was 
I was a big enough moment, but it didn't raise any heckles, really, I think. And uh, for that reason, it was went to, like the referee didn't make anything of it either. I thought it was an instant one, but you take those and you get them. He might have reviewed that and said, no, nothing, nothing to answer, still a try. But I, I thought the Australians would have had a case that that player couldn't possibly make that tackle with Devon Toro nudging him. Mm, they, didn't, they didn't actually make that big a deal of it. They, no, I was surprised. To me, that was a, that was a bigger deal than the, the Pocock incident. Yeah, but Ring Rose, again, he did, he did accept him. Well, well he did. He, he brilliantly took it off his toes, found the gap, stayed low and scored. But I don't think anyone was going to get him once he got into the space. Then. Yeah, clever, clever play by Ireland off the ball. The third try, the winning try, we're going to come to actual try itself, but we just wanted to mention Simon Zebo's hit because momentum was all against Ireland. They were going back down to 24-20, having yeah. had that 17-0 lead. And he comes up with this play. There's a bit of a risk involved here, isn't there? There is. These are game-changing moments, like you know, when you need something to happen. Like you know, there's a great saying in the NFL when coaches run away. They say, "Go up and make something happen." You know, come up with something. Now Zebo makes a read here. He comes up and in, and he does stop the football. He forces the. the this is Hooper. He's going to Yeah, he, yeah. he forces the the, the 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 error. If that ball goes out around the corner, it's just open country, and we don't know where that ends. Probably not a try from that distance. We have enough cover. But we get deep into our own half, the momentum changes completely, and we're really under the cosh. This changes the momentum of the game. But it only works if you stop the football, and he did. Now, in Chicago, he came up and in against the All Blacks. He didn't stop the yeah, football, ben and Smith Ben Smith right. scored. So they're, they're make or break moments, you know, but okay. he got it right that time. He'll insist that he learned from the, from the Ben Smith example. <laughs> yeah, we hope so. <laughs> but the actual construction of the try itself, obviously the, the key is the winning of the game. Um, and we've seen Ireland have some unsuccessful attack in yeah. the 22 in, in this series, but what were the principles behind this that they got so right in this instance? Well, when you get into this part of the field, um, I call it the green zone. If you look at red, white, blue, green in terms of your zones, red is get out of dodge, yeah. white is let's see what happens, green is let's play, or uh, blue is let's play, and green is let's score. When you get in here, the defence has a huge problem. The value of real estate increases dramatically as you get closer to the line. Like one metre here is very valuable, whereas one metre out here doesn't matter too much. So when you're out in this area of the field, you can afford to give up space on the outside and you can reel teams in, give up the yardage, but trap them. The problem here is that you are so close to the line that any piece of real estate you give up, any yard you give up, any bit of grass is very expensive. If you line up like this, it looks harmless. You know, mm. this looks like a pretty benign situation. The defence are nicely in control, a couple of players on the rock, Scrum half, a sweeper, full back, deep sweeper, and then the player spread. But you can't defend like that because teams in this area will try and go through you. They'll try and penetrate the defence. And if you spread out like that, they will penetrate. They'll get into these spaces either side with the pick and jam. Yeah. And we saw it in Chicago in a similar sense. Ireland used the mall and they collapsed the, the, the New Zealand defence. Here we use the one-off runners. And particularly, uh, I think, Tyg Furlong's carry was crucial. Yeah. It, that put a big dent in the defence. Now what happens here is because you're so close to the line, this defence can't spread out. It has to compress. So suddenly, he's got to go tighter, he's got to go tighter, he's got to go tighter, he's got to go tighter. Then he's got to step in and he's got to step in. And the same the other side. Tighter, tighter, tighter. And now the whole landscape changes because the space on the outside here yeah. It's almost impossible to defend. And that width from Ireland is, is key. You have I to keep mention. that width. If you don't keep that width, you're mirroring the defence, which is completely crazy. Yeah. What you want to do in that green zone is compress the defence to stop, to, to, so they try and stop you go through them. By compressing them, the space on the opposite. If they don't compress, you have to go through them and score. Yeah. And so depending on, the, on that ball carrying quality, you mentioned Furlong, I think he got a nice latch from Ulton Jalan, yeah. Peter Mann. And you see a lot of this latching and pick and jam, one off runners, driving into the, the, the seams between the defenders to collapse them. And you only need to eke out a half a metre or a metre at a time, and the defence has to back up and back up, and suddenly their heels are on the goal line, and the next metre is a try or not a try. And that causes the, con the condensation of defenders around the ball, and that leaves you the space on the outside. And this is why you see the cross kick coming in from mm -hmm. here. Like particularly from here, the defence is even more compressed. You can often find the whole team inside the outside post. There's a guy out here in Spend Isolation, a nice spiral across them, yeah. Raj and Crow Park, you see it a thousand times, yeah. and the winger takes it and dots it down. That's yeah. where that comes from, the defence is condensed. That decision making is key as well, because even on, on, in this instance, Zebo he does eventually hit ours, but even a phase before that, they probably could have gone, they a slight overlap and they choose to hit up again with Stanley. It's It's always the way, we talked, uh, I think about it maybe um, a few times before, that Ireland are a bit reticent at times. It's on a bit earlier, 
Now, again, you have to say, you've got to measure twice and cut once because when you go, you've got to score. Like, if you go at the wrong time and you go wide, remember, you will probably be tackled if you are tackled behind the gain line. With no one there to roll. And you, you've, you're short you support and you'll give up five or ten metres very easily. And suddenly, you have to restart your attack 50 metres out when you were five. So the moment you decide to go, it has to be absolutely clinical. You must score. So sometimes teams will go, we'll play one more and have a look. And that's okay. But you can't play one more, one more, one more, one more, because eventually maybe you run out of steam or someone gets in and steals the ball or you go off your feet and the ref gives a penalty. So it's about timing. But the principle is the same. Condense the defence and exploit the corners. And if they don't condense, go through them and score. Yeah, it's such a key aspect of, of rugby to, to be able to, to finish it. How do, how, how do you coach this or how do you specifically work on it's this? Your green it zone, it's your green zone strategy. It can be for a mall. You take a mall, you drive it in field, you create a big short side. And if they don't defend the mall, you rumble it in. Whereas they come in to defend the mall, the corner's open. And you, you saw it in Chicago, Ireland started with a line out here. They drove it towards the post. New Zealand condensed, Zebo stayed wide, Johnny Sexton came short side, Simple two pass. passes. As I said, thanks for the use of the hall, and away you go. Yeah, S same again this time. And it's so encouraging to see Ireland finish that way with their, their well, 22 we, attack. Yeah, we, we've been critical of Ireland maybe in the Six Nations of being too condensed and too many more runners. We've now seen them more have more awareness. And I thought against, you know, against Canada, if we go back to that game, where it was a much less experienced team, you saw that lack of awareness in the green zone against Canada when they could have scored a couple of times by going a bit earlier wide and they played one more phase you know, when they didn't need to. And that's kind of confidence and experience on when to pull the trigger and when to go wide. Yeah, some big plays from Simon Zebra again. He's one of the guys who's, who's had a great month. Well, he's got the X factor, to be fair to him. You know, he has that capacity to make things happen out of nothing, like we saw the first try. There was nothing on. He put in the sublime grubber and went under the post. That's the X factor, you know, and he has that. But... I suppose the other side of Simon is that inability sometimes to, to make the right decisions at the right time can hurt you. If he comes up and in at the wrong time, it can be very hurt. But on the weekend, it worked very well. So yeah. that's, that's it. He's one of a few nice options in the back three. We're, we're going to come back to that actual personnel side of it. But just collectively from Ireland, it's a good time to obviously review what, what they've done over the f past four matches. We probably dismissed Canada game almost because there were so many changes and it's a, s a second tier nation. But three huge tests against two of the best teams in oh, the world. Yeah. Where do Ireland stand coming into the Six Nations or what are the big kind of questions for them moving into 2017? Well, the autumn is a great barometer for us now. We've played, as you said, we've played New Zealand twice, Australia once. We've won two out of three. That's a fantastic return. Because of the injury situation and if you throw South Africa into the mix on that, because of the injury situation, we've got a lot, lot larger squad, more players involved. Um, the truth is, international coaches generally change the team when they have to because every game has to be won. To be fair to George Schmidt, the changes he's made, he's made very good selections. Guys have come in and they've really fronted up. Josh van der Flyer has been outstanding now and we can talk about him separately. But he has now built the depth based on good selections and guys fitting in really well. And even on the weekend with the injuries, guys went out and they filled roles they've probably never been again. It's hard to imagine Kieran Marmy will ever play on the wing again for Ireland. But the guy fronted up and did a good job. But the squad has more depth in it. Um, psychologically, we've been to the well a few times and we've come out the right side of it. Um, we, we're now probably more comfortable in our skin. We've better our leadership built around the team. A lot of positives. Technically, our set pace in the autumn has been outstanding. Linus has been top drawer. Some of the stats there, yeah. Yeah, Linus 90%. Scrum, we've lost one scrum in the autumn series. Yeah, incredible. It's incredible. Because, you know, we've always thought that teams would target us at the scrum. Well, now maybe the Southern Hemisphere teams don't target you as much. Mm. Certainly New Zealand don't. And, and, uh, and Australia don't. Uh, because Australia don't regard themselves as a strong scrum. But the truth be known, we, had one, we lost one scrum in the autumn. Our ball retention has been extraordinary, like 96%. And the fact that we're holding onto the ball more, we're really making defences work very hard. Mm. Even against the Wallabies, you saw a bit of that wide, wide in, inside their yeah. half as an exit strategy rather than just as an attacking Well, team. I think the balance is better in our game now. We were very predictable before on our exits when we kicked the contestables. And teams adjusted to that. They put better guys under the high ball. They, they built a lot of their counter-attack off us kicking the ball to them. But we've decided now we don't kick that much. And if you want to drop back three deep, we'll move the ball and bring you up. It's what you have to do. So I think there's a better balance to our attack. I think our ball retention is very good. So given our, 
rock solid set piece, great ball retention, we can build huge pressure on teams and maybe that's why they're giving away penalties because we're holding on to the ball so much and we're so disciplined. Um, it's I a matter of turning that pressure into maybe more tries or more points. Yeah, and, and the one other thing I'll put onto it is our possession and our territory over those, these autumn games have been really high, almost 60% in all averaging. Yeah. Now, they are kind of, they could be anomalies in the sense that it's hard to believe we'll have 60% possession and territory against teams like Wales or against teams like England or even France. So that dynamic can change in the, in the, in the Six Nations. We may not have as much territory and ball. Will we be as disciplined in others? Will we come out of every game with a penalty count of, you know, 10 penalties in the positive? I don't know. So let's change it around. What if teams have more possession and more territory? and we give away more penalties. Now, will we be able to sustain our defence? And our defence has been a little, has been a problem. Yeah, missed tackles, what if you missed tackles? Our missed tackles are quite high. We're at like just over 80% in our tackle nice. count. That's a worry because we're conceding in excess of three tries in the last, those games in the autumn. Over three tries a game on average, or 40% possession from the opposition. Yeah. If that and possession goes up, do teams score more tries? So our, our defence has not been superb. Is that a case of the quality of the opposition? Because even still, the players are raving about Andy Farr and what he brings. And even watching him on the pitch before the game on Saturday, they're absolutely wrapped whenever he's talking. They can't get enough of this guy. Well, That's fine, and I don't doubt that for a moment. But you can only judge it on what's happening on the field. Yeah. And we are leaking over three tries a game against an average of 40% possession. That You'd have to say that's something that we have to address. Because if teams like England get 50% possession, or Wales get 50% possession, or France get 50% possession, would we leak more than three tries? I don't know. We'll, we'll find out for sure, I think, in the autumn or in the, in the spring. Um, the other side of it then is our ability to score. With all that possession, we're still averaging less than three tries a game. And we are getting better at scoring tries. But that dynamic could change that we had in this autumn. If you think about it, fantastic set piece, fantastic ball retention, fantastic discipline, fantastic territory, fantastic possession. And we're scoring less than three tries a game, if that changes to 50-50 across the board, yeah. you know, uh, will, will, will we be able to sustain that level of performance? Mm. I think Darren probably look back on quite a few missed opportunities, like you mentioned the set and that's always such a source for them, those yeah. line-out tries, and you think of those missed chances against the All Blacks in particular yeah. with the, the transfer from Sean Bynard, or missed them all in the corner, Yeah, they need to convert, they need to convert converting those, converting those. Yeah. and I think as well, like, you know, if you step back a little bit again and look at Australia, what would Australia say in the team room this morning? When they circle up, well, they'll have a discussion about the referee and the discipline, and that's right too because they had two yellow cards, and there were two yellow cards, and potentially one was a red. Mm. But park that for a moment. They know they butchered three or four chances on the weekend. You oh, know, Israel flair with that clear overlap. Yeah, a couple of couple of passes stick. New Zealand or Australia probably win the game. So, like those passes could stick, you know, in, in Cardiff, and it's a different outcome. So, they're the things that could change against us. So. We, we need to stay where we are in terms of quality, possession and retaining it, great discipline, but we probably need to shut teams down more through phase defence and we probably need to eke out some more tries ourselves with the possession we have. Yeah, I think Joe Schmidt was quite realistic after the game on Saturday we spoke to him and you're kind of half hoping he's going to say we're going to go out and win the situation. No, I, I think he was very he honest, he was very, very honest in what he said, he, sa he felt that they were lucky to survive. Now, he did factor in the changes and the, 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 the injuries, and rightly so. The guy's playing way out of position for most of the game. But I think he is smart enough to see that, yeah, we were lucky. A couple of those passes stick, and we're all of our heads down today. And he, yeah. he did admit that, and he's bloody honest about it, and you have to admire him for that. As always. And he was quite realistic also about the, the new faces in Ireland squad, and that's kind of what we want to touch on next. The, the depth, this perception of, of depth in the squad, he was very realistic even about Gary Ringrose. Asked yeah. him about Gary doing really well. He says, "Listen, Robbie Henshaw would have been playing this game sure. if he was fit, and we missed his his physicality, staying square sure. on the line, and hitting yeah. guys." Nonetheless, Gary Ringrose did really well. Do, do you think they have uh, a lot more kind of options that are at that? Oh, they have. Yeah. Probably? Look, the upside of what with injuries is if you use that space really well, you bring in new players and you blood them, and they get used to playing at that level, and they get used to being in that environment, and then when you have to go to them again. It's not a shock to the system. And you know that they can do it. Like, we know the old story is a player can be fantastic for their province, for their club. It's the next step up, can they make it? And you find out on the day. You know, if guys have 
often come through the system, looked the real part, gone in and struggled. Now, maybe they come back later, but Ring Rose has delivered. You know, the guys have, have come in. I think I, I go back to Van der Flair again, who to me has been the find of the season. The guy has been seen right through the season as a filler for when Shawnee comes back or Peter Romani comes back or, you know, Ian Henderson comes back. You know, he's a filler. The guy has put up his hand big time and said, hey, I'm here to stay. You want my shirt, you better come and take it. And that to me is fantastic. And if a coach ever wants a headache, it's one of those selection headaches where they sit down and they have so many options available to them to pick their team that they get a migraine at the end of it. And that's the kind of headache Joe Schmidt has at the moment if everyone stays healthy. I think that's probably where the optimism will come from. And sure. We mentioned before we came in, people are probably going to be expecting a Six Nations success almost after, after some of those big wins. Where do you see that at the moment? Like England are obviously on a, an amazing yeah. streak and other nations are a little bit resurgent. France even showing some nice signs of oh, former glories, as Steve Hansen said. <laughs> But, w but where do you see if you, if you can, yeah, if, if you can believe France for a moment, yeah. I think if you look at the Six Nations, it's, it's, it, I don't want to say it, but it's, a, it's, if you're going to win a Grand Slam, it's this rotation where you've got France and England in Dublin, and then you've got to go on the road and see if you can beat Italy, Scotland, and Wales. I don't think we should be thinking about losing in Rome or, or Edinburgh. Our history is too strong for that. I would say, yeah, Cardiff is always a tricky one, but. Whether I prefer to try and win in Cardiff or away in Twickenham and Paris, I'd buy that deal. I'd go to Cardiff and try and get a win. So I think the two key games really are England and Wales. Wales away, England at home. And I think, I don't know what to expect from Wales. They've had their ups and downs, but they tend to deliver at home in the Six Nations. I think England are the team to beat, you know. But the one thing I go back to is on our analysis is that we somehow have to find a way of delivering the same level of performance on 50% position and 50% territory, and a penalty count of 10 each, you know, and being able to eke out more tries with, with less possession and stop teams scoring more tries with more possession. They are the key things. If we can switch that dynamic, a Grand Slam could be there. But if we stay in this dynamic where, you know, we have to have 60% possession to win a game or 60% territory, and we have to have a very low penalty count against a high penalty count, if things don't go that way in the Six Nations, they could unravel you in a place like Cardiff or even in Dublin against a team like England. Yeah, I'm sure Joe Schmidt is already working on those big challenges. Sure he is. Eddie, thanks so much for joining us. It's been brilliant having you in the last couple of weeks. We've really enjoyed it. My thanks pleasure. so much, everyone at home, for watching. We'll catch you soon.